Welcome, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show, providing inspiration, strategies, and insight to empower women investors to live balanced and financially free lives. Now, here are your co-hosts, Liz and Andressa. So in today's episode, you are in for a real treat. We have Stacey Danford. She is an educational neuroscientist. Before you stop the recording, this was <laughs> such an amazing interview because she gives such great content around how your brain works and how it impacts your, your everyday life, including your business. One of the things we talked very specifically about is that when you're working with tenants, investors, whomever your client is, so to speak, how you really need to know their gratitude language. Mm. So I'm not going to say more about that, but very powerful when we're enrolling people, when we're building teams, when we're building our businesses. It's so powerful. And then she also goes into awareness, right? Why do we always like look forward to get that property or that vacation? And once we get it, we don't get the happiness that we were thinking, right? She goes, she breaks that down. You're going to finally get the answer about that. But the most important thing, she just she's just like a magical person that she can transform like brain language into something that can be digestible for all of us. And how can we use that in our day to day business? Can't miss this episode. I promise you. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies. This is Liz. And this is Andressa. Welcome back to the Real Estate Investor Show, where we take a really big stand every week in everything we do, right, Andressa, to empower women to live a financially free and balanced life. And whatever balance means to you, right, Andressa? We like to make sure we say that. <laughs> over and over again. Until you get over and over again. Get tired. <laughs> But we really are uh, so thankful for everyone coming back with us for another episode. We have Stacy Danford on today's show. Stacy, thank you so much for being with us. So excited to jump into um, the brain power and all the good stuff we're going to be talking about today. So thank you for being here. You're so welcome. I'm so excited. Uh, so appreciative of that. And before we do that, we always like to get connected to all of you, which again, uh, we just appreciate you making time to connect with us and to, you know, to listen and to engage because that's what we love. So Andressa, what is coming up for you? Some quick tip, idea, something you want to share, and then we'll jump into Stacy's story. Mm -hmm. I want to share a quick story about my son. And I hope Lorenzo, if you're listening to it years and years <laughs> from now, honey, you're, you're laughing at it as, as well. Right. So um, mom is going to be sharing a lot of stuff that you've done throughout your entire life. So he's six years old and he's bilingual, right? He speaks, of course, English and Portuguese from my side, Italian from his side, his dad's side. And he's in the phase that he's um, I guess trying the limits and, and, and checking the boundaries. And another day we were having dinner and he spits out this Italian, um, I would say curse word. Right. And I was like, well, I just spit whatever I had in my mouth. And of course I started laughing and I'm not supposed to laugh. At, at, at this because it's not cool, but my, that was my first reaction. And then the next day he did it again. But then this time I was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? This is not a proper language for, for your age. And then he said, that's not me. It's Carlos. So let me explain to you guys who the hell is Carlos. My son's name is Lorenzo. But we had a conversation for all the, the Strive members that are listening. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We named Lorenzo's brain Carlos because I explained to him that we are not our thoughts. It's different. And that little voice, it's, it's, it's part of who we are, but it's not us entirely. So we, he named Carlos. So he said, it's Carlos. And I was like, oh, okay. So, so that's Carlos cursing, right? Tell Carlos that that's a no, no for now. Yeah. He needs to do better. Right. Mom It's like, yes, honey, Carlos needs to do better. Sometimes Carlos tries things out. Right. So you just need to understand it's not bad or good. It's just better choices that we need to make moving forward. All right. Got it. Got it. I'll tell Carlos that. So the reason why I'm saying this to you 
because we hear this voice inside our brains as real estate investors. This is sometimes a known stop. When you go to bed, you, you keep hearing it. And many times it's not an empowering voice. It is a very, you know, judgmental voice or, or you know, you, you can name it. And, and many times the only thing that we can say is that thanks for sharing. And Nate, by the way, name your brain. My name, my brain's name is Rhonda and Liz is Debbie. So if you hear that coming up, that's what's happening. So just acknowledge, just acknowledge and just let go. So I'm really excited about today's episode that we're going to talk about our brain power. So this is just like super, super cool. And I'm very selfish about it. <laughs> Rhonda and Andres are very, very selfish. Yeah, about Debbie, it. Debbie and Liz are very excited too. Um, I love that. <laughs> I love that story, Andresa, about your son. So the, the Carlos, it wasn't me, it was Carlos, but that's great. Um, Stacey, with, without further ado, you know, as we jump into uh, just all the questions we have for you around the work you're, you, you do professionally, but we always like to get started of where this all began for you personally, um, because our journeys are our journeys and there's such meaning there. So for you to become a happiness expert and 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 have, have such expertise in neuroscience, where did that all begin for you? It all began, strangely enough, with the worst student I ever taught in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a teacher for 25 years. And I always had such a great connection with my students and I always had, you know, just wonderful relationships. But one year I had a student come into my classroom and he was 16 years old, mad at the world, literally the worst kid I ever taught. I could not reach him. I couldn't get him to behave. And I was just kind of at my wits end. So I came home one day and I was in tears and I was telling my daughter, who was a senior in high school at the time, I was like, what do I do to make this kid behave? And she looked at me and she said, mom, what do you know about him? And I said, what do you mean? What do I know about him? I said, I know he's terrible. That's what I know. And she said, exactly. You know nothing. And she said, no one cares how much you teach them until they know you care about them. And I was like, wow. And I said, so what do I do? And she said, start saying something nice to him learn about him and then he will care about you. So the very next day I started, you know, putting my 18 year old daughter's advice into gear. And he was probably the worst that day that he's ever been. He was terrible. And I was like, I was determined I was going to find one thing. And so I tell this 16 year old boy, Andrew, I love the way you part your hair. (laughs) <laughs> that's what you got that's all I can, and he looked at me like lady you have lost your mind anyway so every day after that I would tell him something and I had to work hard sometimes to find something nice about him and nothing changed for three weeks then finally after three weeks he walked into my room one day and he said hey miss d what's up and I was like oh my gosh it's working it's working he ended up being the favorite student I ever taught in my whole entire life. He ended up leaving that school because he was not that nice in all the other teachers' classes, but we still keep in contact today. And I have his painting on my wall still to remind me that one little moment of kindness can end up changing somebody's life, but he also changed mine. About 10 years after that happened, he invited me to go have coffee one day And I asked him, I said, Andrew, why did you treat me so much differently than you did everybody else? And he said, Miss Danford, you smiled at me every time you saw me and you made me feel like you were grateful I was alive. And I was like, oh my God, that was the first day I had ever heard the word grateful used in that context. I had always thought it was saying thank you or, you know, just being thankful. And I went home that day and started studying about gratitude and decided I'm going back to school. I'm going back to school to understand how that changed his brain and how it changed my brain. Mm. And mm. that was what my graduate research study was on is gratitude. Mm. Well, I, I had a question, but I cannot miss this, this part here about gratitude because we're big fans of Brené Brown and she talks about gratitude and the contest. I think that we take it very, very slight, like, oh, say thank you. So the, the kids are are trained to say, and what do you say? Say thank you. Take 
is just like automatic, right? Yes. So there is an, as you are saying, a deeper connection with gratitude. Right. So is there, how can we really be grateful? Honestly, is yeah. there, is there, uh, um, we don't want to be ungrateful, ladies. Right. Uh, hang on tight. <laughs> hang, hang tight with my thought here. <laughs> we don't want to be ungrateful, or we don't want to be perceived as ungrateful. How can we convey our gratitude with 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 our whole soul and and organically, yes. if that makes sense? Yes, that that's exactly what my research study was about. Because eighty eight percent of the population thinks they're grateful. And hmm. that was that was my own personal data. But when in actuality, only four percent are scientifically grateful to hmm. the extent to which it alters your brain chemicals. And hmm. that's the kind of gratitude that people talk about that changes your brain. It changes your body. It changes your life because only four percent of the population are actually doing that kind of gratitude because the difference is. I call it casual thanks, just saying thank you. And, you know, somebody holds a door open for you or somebody lets you in in traffic and you kind of give the little happy wave. That's not gratitude. That's just saying thank you. That's appreciation. It's different. Mm. But deep gratitude has to activate the chemicals in your brain because it activates an emotional feeling. So it's so easy. That's what my TED talk was about. It only takes 10 to 30 seconds to get yourself to move into that kind of gratitude. And the secret is to ask your brain, why? Why am I grateful? Why am I saying thank you? Because when you have to ask why, the answer is in the prefrontal cortex because it's a deeper level of thinking and it activates the network in your brain like a spider web to go back and figure out why it is you're grateful. But the why activates the emotion and the emotion activates the chemicals and the chemicals are what we want. So let's say you're at Starbucks and you drive through the line, you know, and you get your Starbucks coffee and you say thank you and you drive away. That's not gratitude. But if you just take 10 seconds and hold the coffee and just think, oh, my gosh, I'm so grateful that somebody made this exactly to my order. I love the taste of the bitter and the sweet mixture. I love that it's so piping hot. I can see the steam. You've done it. That's all it takes. But it's a conscious effort rather than an automatic response of saying thank you. I love this so much. I love this so much. And I love reading dissertations. (laughs) So so breaking, breaking that, that down a little bit more. So you're, you're holding the cup of coffee. Cause I think this is really important. You're holding the cup of coffee. The steam is coming off of it. You, you, you get connected to maybe the people that prepared it or, you know, the money that you have to do that. Right. right? So there, what, what makes it deeper though? Like, do you actually do some breath work around it? Are you visualizing something like this. Like, I, I don't think I'm, I'm probably at times thinking I'm in the 88 percentile and I'm probably in the 4%. And I, I really want to get through on this because there is that emotional connection. So what does that look like beyond just the saying? Is it a feeling? Is it a, a like a, it sort of has a cadence? to be a feeling. It doesn't have to be any kind of deep anything. That's where people get a little bit like, I don't have time for gratitude. And, but it really can take that. It's just asking yourself why in the specifics of it or what activate the brain into feeling like, even when I talk about it, I get excited because I do it every single day, hundreds of times a day. Mm. And I, I, I truly think I'm the most grateful person in the universe because I do it all day, every day. And when I first started, however, I made sure I did it once a day until I understood the difference. I could feel it kick in. I was like, oh, I just felt it. I just felt the emotional connection to it. And literally, once you get started, you know, one of the sayings is the more grateful you are, the more things you have to be grateful for. And that's part of the brain system called the reticular activating system. It's in the base of your brain. It's tiny. It's about this big and, you know, thinner than your pinky finger, but it's the filtering system through which the rest of your brain sees the world. 
And once the system gets activated daily to look for things to be grateful for, it tells your brain, filter that in. Apparently, this is important to this chick because she keeps doing it all day, every day. Because this area of the brain, the reticular activating system is in the lizard brain. That area of the brain cannot think, but it Mm. learns. And that's important difference. It cannot think, but it learns. And it learns based on repetition. Whatever you repeat daily over and over and over, it assumes is important to you. So it filters it through. So if you think you're fat and ugly and worthless and loser every day, every day, every day, remember this can't think. So it doesn't know if this hurts your feelings. It just assumes that this is important to you. And it's learned you've done it every day for 40 years. Oh, I'll just let every incident where you feel fat, ugly, loser, worthless filter on through because it doesn't think it just learns. Gratitude works exactly the same way. This is magical. I feel that that's like a algorithm of our brain, right? Like yes. Facebook ads that keep look. OK, she likes that. She likes this. She's like mm. that. So it just becomes that I, I want to from the other side, right, from the person that receives the the the, the gratitude, something happened uh, uh, to me that I was like, this is what I feel her gratitude through this. So years and years ago, um, I welcome refugee family on my Airbnb. Uh, and uh, the investor community has helped buying food and, and Amazon stuff. It was wonderful uh, welcoming that, that family. And they live close by on my birthday, Easter, Christmas. This woman does not fail to send me her wishes. And then this past week, she said, my daughter, my daughter, Elena, is going to get married. And I would like to invite your family to come because you guys are family to 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 us. Like, that is what gratitude is all about. Yeah. I know this woman is going to be in my life forever because we're going to adopt each other uh, as family. But the, 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 the great, I can feel it. Yes. I can, I can feel it. The deep gratitude. There's no exchange of, of, you know, nothing else, but I can, I can feel it. Feel it. So if I can feel it, I can use that as a base. Oh yeah. Does that make sense? Because yes. I can use that. That's what gratitude is, looks like. Yes. So I'm going to use that as a base. That Perfect. makes sense. And yes, that's exactly right. Because part of the problem is People, you know, in the general population who hear the word gratitude all the time, you know, it's everywhere. They think it's 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 part of the giving and exchanging of things. And you say thank you when you get a thing. That's not really true. It can be that, but it can also be, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful for the sunshine. You know, I'm so grateful for the fact that I live in a place where I hear birds. I'm grateful for the breeze on my face because it reminds me I'm alive. It, it can be something that your brain appreciates and that's all it has to be. But what you said is really important when it has to do with person to person. The data is very, very clear that gratitude is the number one predictor of a happy, healthy relationship whether that is friend to friend, spouse, child, business partner to associate, employee to boss, it doesn't matter what the relationship, the data is crystal clear that the number one predictor of how well that relationship goes is gratitude and appreciation. We all know when somebody appreciates us and how great it makes us feel, but we sometimes forget that we need to give that as well. And gratitude is a reciprocal chemical process in the brain. And there's something called brain to brain synchrony when two brains sync up, which is one of the reasons why sex is so powerful. It's a synchronicity of, of chemical reactions in the brain and the body, but it ha- gratitude does the same thing. So just like you were talking about with this lady, she is very grateful for you, but you are also very grateful for her that she yeah. truly appreciated the gift that you gave her. So it is such a reciprocal thing to parents and children. You know, think about your children when they tell you, mom, thank you so much for making my favorite meal. You just go, oh, I want to cook it every day. You know, you, you love that feeling. It is a powerful, powerful chemical process. Even when we are in the zone, right, Liz, we say that we're on the zone here. 
when her and I get into conversations like, yeah, brainstorms and yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I really, I do love that. And it's, then, then I, and then I think about the situations that a lot of women are listening to have a harder time in those situations to be grateful, right? The contractor who steals the money, the, the team member who doesn't show up, um, the partnership that fails, right? The property, they, they lose, they, they're losing properties left and right because of the crazy competitive market, right? What, 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 and, and then fill in the blank, right? Whatever people are dealing with. So how do, how do women listening and, and how do all of us in, in those challenging times, in those moments of just, you know, things are not working well and we're, we hear so much, what can you be grateful for? What can you be grateful for? Sometimes I'm like, I don't want to be grateful for anything in this situation. <laughs> I, mean, I moved through that to be perfectly frank, but then I moved through that. I'm like, right, what can I be once I start to get into a better state? Right. And I don't, I'm not a 10, I'm, I'm a little few things down and I'm like, okay, what can I be? And then I start to get into a better place. But what are some suggestions for the women listening that, you know, are, are they have that situation in their, their life right now with, with their investing business that, Gratitude seems so far away, but yet we all know that's where we want to get to, to shift the pendulum. So what are some of those kind of steps that they can take to to get into a better feeling place? Yeah. Okay. That's such a great question. And that's one of the myths of gratitude is it's the cure-all and it's not. And matter of fact, the newest research shows that people that force themselves to be grateful, it actually backfires. Mm. And because if you hate it, and you hate making a list of 10 things every day and you just dread (laughs) it, then you're telling your brain, I dread this. This is dreadful. So Mm. your brain is connecting those two things because when gratitude kind of first came out, everybody was like, make a list of 10 things every day or make a list of 50 things every day. Well, at first it feels great because you're like, oh my gosh, I have so many things to be grateful for. But then, you know, day 20 and you're tired and you've had a fight with your spouse and you're like, Oh, I don't feel grateful. Right. And so your brain associates it with that. Mm-hmm. So the truth is, and the new data shows that being grateful for one thing in detail is as powerful, if not more than making a list of 10 things or 20 uh-huh. things or 50 things. And the, the secret is the detail. And so I, at dinner every night, we go around the table and we say one thing we're grateful for, but the Kicker is we have to say why, and we give as much detail as possible because Mm -hmm. the details are what activate the hippocampus in the brain where all the memories come from. And joy only goes to short-term memory and trauma and danger and sadness and hurt go to long-term memory because your brain wants to hold on to it so it can protect you from it. But joy is not a threat to your survival. Your brain has not held on to every happy moment that ever happened in your life. It just comes and it goes. Yes. And so that's Mm. what's important is you have to activate. Why am I going to hold on to this? Why am I going to keep this? I want my brain to hold this for me and move it to long term instead of just fleeting, come and go, come and go, come and go. So it's so important, even in the crummy days, to think of, you know, maybe it's at night and the only thing you're grateful for is the fact you have a, a bed to sleep in or, you know what, today sucked. I just hated all of it. But I know there's people in this family who love me and are going to support me tomorrow through my crummy day. And just getting your brain to be specific about one thing still keeps that system, the reticular activating system flowing to go, you know what? I can be sad about the situation, but I still have something to be grateful for. And that's kind of the secret. And when you shove emotions down and say, well, I'm supposed to be grateful, but I feel terrible. You're doing yourself actually a disservice. You really need to feel your feelings. And that's part of, you know, the toxic positivity. Just get happy. Well, there's some things you just can't get happy about. Like, you know, maybe there's a death. Maybe there's a loss. Maybe you had to file bankruptcy. Maybe you lost your dream house or, you know, something that hurts. It does hurt. And when you do not acknowledge the pain, you're actually giving your brain a permission to create a coping mechanism to mm. say, okay, you don't know what to do with this. All right, I'll, I'll fix it for you. Probably a drink would help. Probably take some drugs, probably go shopping. You know, all the coping mechanisms we've had over our lifetime start to kick in because our brain remembers them because pain goes to long-term memory. And so your brain's constant state is moving you away from pain and toward pleasure. 
depending on what that pleasure is, it could be good for you or bad for you. And the key is to teach your brain to create systems and pathways for good pleasure instead of, you know, sex, drugs, gambling, drug, you know, all the things, alcoholism that are feel pleasurable at the time, but they end up creating pain in the long run. Well, I'm a system and process junkie. So now, Liz, you know what I'm going to do. Create systems and process for my brain. <laughs> that makes total sense because I was uh, looking at older album, albums of, of videos and pictures of when my child was younger. I don't have those memories. And I was like, some of them are so cute and, and so, you know, precious to me that I was like, how I don't remember this moment. Thank yeah. God there is a there's a video there. But I think that what you're saying right now is consci- consciously telling my brain, okay, this goes to the long term bucket. Yes, this Th- I'm goes holding there. on to. Yes. But if I'm not present to it, if I'm just passing by and not taking a moment, which I think that a lot of the the ladies that are listening, we have a lot on our plate, and sometimes we just go, right? We just go with the, the, the flow and we don't take a moment to take a deep breath to appreciate that time. I want to read something that you wrote on the, the form. People are not the problem. Personality is not the problem. Brain patterns are the problem. And when you understand those, you unlock the next level of business. I mean, this is, this is super powerful. Right. Yes. And and I don't think a lot of people, right, including me, my my blind spot, we are not aware of our brain patterns. So how do we start to even get into that awareness uh, stage? It's so, so important because we feel like, you know, life is happening to us and the people are making us mad or the people are making us happy. That is not true. People are never the problem. It is patterns that are the problem. And it kind of takes a little pressure off you because you're like, oh, I'm not broken. I'm not messed up. I'm not messing up. My patterns are messing up and patterns are fixable. Patterns are changeable. The greatest discovery of neuroscience in the last hundred years is neuroplasticity. And that tells us up until the day we die, our brain has the ability to be malleable and change. But how does it change? Repetition. Repetition is the secret to everything. What do you do consistently? That's going to be your life. Whatever you do consistently on a daily basis, do you gripe every day? Do you complain every day? Do you fuss every day? Do you look at the weather every day and go, God, it's so hot, it's so cold? Or do you wake up and go, Oh my gosh, I'm going to kill it today. Today is going to be my day. And when you understand these patterns, so part of what I do in my business is give people a brain pattern analysis. And I discover what are the five basic brain patterns that are coming through your reticular activating system. And because your whole system is being filtered through this area. But if if you don't have a brain pattern analysis, then you can still try to understand and analyze your own brain. What things always make you happy? What things always hurt your feelings? What things always upset you? What things always create anxiety for you? Just take note, be aware of what's going on in your own brain. So one of my, I have my brain patterns right here on a little card and I literally look at them every single day. These are the, mm-hmm. my five basic brain patterns. I never make a decision without looking at these patterns because this is the way my brain works. So one of my number one brain patterns is beauty. I love beauty, not just in people, but in things. I love a beautiful yard. I love a beautiful place setting. I love beautiful color. I love furniture behind you that yes. I'm about, right? <laughs> you guys are listening. You got to watch to see the fun, beautiful furniture behind her. That's the yes. Truth. I love birds. I have bird feeders and hummingbird feeders. I love beauty. So, oh, now I know why a messy house makes me mad. And I used to get mad at the people who did it. And I would come home from speaking and I would walk in the door and I have my plane jet lag and I've got my suitcase and I walk in and the kitchen's got dishes and I (laughs) became like evil. And I would start grabbing at the people I loved and missed because I thought the people were the problem. 
And yes, the people mm-hmm. made the mess, but the real <laughs> problem is what my brain said about my beauty has been stolen. This has been taken from me. Y'all better give it back. Now that I understand this is a pattern, I just tell them, oh my gosh, let's all get this cleaned up so I can enjoy being home. Or now they know me well enough to know, ooh, mom's going to look at the dishes first thing when she gets here. We better make this clean. And it's so powerful to know how your brain works. There are no two brains alike in all the world, not even identical twins. And you've got to know your brain. That's your responsibility because the world is not going to make you happy. The world is not here for your joy and amusement. And sadly, your brain does not care about your happiness. It does not care about you at all. That's what most people don't realize. They think, oh, you don't make me happy anymore. No, that's not true. Your brain is your job. You have to make yourself happy. Your joy is your job. And if somebody is upsetting you, you need to know why. The why is the problem, not the people. Oh, this is this. I'm laughing here because I just moved to to a new house and we had different boxes, right? And I kept in boxes until I had a place for the stuff inside the box go. My mom and my sister came to visit And they unbox everything. And when I got home, things were unboxed. In their head, they were thinking, we're helping. We're helping. And that's in my head. I was like, what the hell just (laughs) happened over here? So what I'm looking at is that I like levels of organization. And that messiness mess up with my with my day. Yes. And then when I express that, they said is like, you're ungrateful. And then we're like, what? What's going on over here? And it's just just a breakdown. Right. But looking looking back, I'm learning about, as you saying about my brain pattern that I appreciate organization. And that goes across the board. Right. It could be a Dropbox fo- folder that it's messy is the same thing as clothes, clothing on the floor or a shelf where the books are unorganized backwards, upside down. I cannot live with that. <laughs> <laughs> I am, as you were saying, so I guess it, it is part of, of my, my, my brain pattern. Now, my next question is, How can I adjust, live with it? Or what do we do after that, that we are aware of it, right? And then we cannot force people to to do anything, but how can we find a common ground once we are aware of those and honor that part of us? It's so important to just, number one, be aware of it. That's the first step. So be aware of your patterns and then recognize how they're impacting you. Oh, these always bring me joy. Oh, these always bring me frustration. These make me mad. These hurt my feelings. And I tell everybody, all of my clients, you need to keep a trigger journal for at least 30 days and just write down every trigger, everything that triggered an emotion powerful enough for you to remember. Was it super joyful? Was it super frustrating? Because one of the things when I first started, I recognized I was at Target And I was checking out at Target and I was talking to the lady and she never made eye contact with me. And she was like, how are you? You know, fine. You know, and I was, I kept trying to like talk to her. Oh, I love your eyelashes. Oh my gosh. And she is like, thanks. And and so I got to the car and I was feeling down, grumpy, frumpy, dumpy. You know, I'm like, oh my gosh, she wouldn't even speak to me. And I knew that it hurt my feelings. And I was like, Stacy, you don't even know this lady. How are you letting that impact you? Well, I got all the way home and I was still sad. And then my husband said one little thing to me and then I, you know, bit his head off. And I was like, oh my goodness, that for me is one of my patterns of dedication. I'm always dedicated to speak, to make eye contact, to talk to people. I care about humans And it hurt my feelings because I felt the dedication was not reciprocal and she wasn't dedicated to her job and her customer service and all the things that bother me. Yes. And I was like, oh, but I didn't realize how this was connected until I wrote that in my journal. 
And I was like, what does the lady at Target have to do with people cutting me off in traffic? What does that have to do with my neighbor pulling out and not noticing me? All of it has to do with a reciprocal dedication. And I was like, oh, okay. That seems to be the brain pattern that gives me the most pain, but I didn't know it until I wrote it down. So I really think for everybody out there, number one, write down your triggers, write down what's going on. And then most importantly, when you figure out the similarities, create an alternate plan when you're in a good space, because most of us try to take care of a situation in the middle of the situation that does not work well. And I use this example all the time and it's terrible, but it's true. You know, when you're in, you know, college or whatever, and you're on a date and, you know, and you're trying to decide like, am I into this guy or not? And all of a sudden he's got his pants off. You're like, oh, like it's too late to be making a good decision now. (laughs) Like you should have had that all planned out before the pants came off. So it's the same way with our brain. When we're sad, it's too late to make a plan for what you do with your sadness. Mm. You need to have a plan when you're in a great state, when you're understanding, oh, okay, lack of dedication always hurts my feelings. What am I going to do when that happens? So I have a plan for all five of my patterns, And I give them to myself. So when I feel like dedication has been crushed for me, I call somebody that I know is 100% dedicated to me. I have a best friend that I know if I called her at 2 a.m., she'd answer the phone. And I'll tell her, I'll say, I just need a little dedication. And she'll go, oh my gosh, you don't have to talk to you, you know, whatever. And it gives me back what was taken from me. And I'm like, okay, now I'm good to go. But I have to be responsible for what's going on in my head. The world is not here to make me happy. My joy is my job. I absolutely love that. You know, I'm just thinking about where we're planning uh, a trip in the summer and the amount of time it takes to plan a trip is a lot, right? Especially because we have we have a few things we're going to do. We're going to take the month and, and, and go away with our kiddos. And then that thought as you're talking made me think about how much time people put into planning trips, planning their projects, planning their flips, right? Buying the next rental property. Yet how much time do they actually take to create a plan yeah. to get- <laughs> For their into, own head, yeah. For their own head, <laughs> Like, what am I, you know, what are my five tricks, you know, and then I'm going through it. I'm like, wow, what if most of us spent more time on that type of planning versus planning? Not that we shouldn't plan trips, but it just boggles my mind. I'm sure I'm mean, sure you see this because you're the expert, but it leads me to, it leads me to another, another question. It's taking responsibility. Like you, this is like, this is like, you're, you're, you're in charge here. Yes. You know, don't be blaming. And I think that's easier for some. And, and, and harder for others. Probably the women listening to our podcast, it's probably easier for. They probably, they probably would agree that they're responsible. But there's a lot of people in the world that that thought is not even in their context, not even in right. their sphere, right? So I, I guess the, the, the question for you and the, the thought for the women listening too is that to move them through these things, we use affirmations, we use positive thinking. We, we know how important mantras are. No one would disagree with that. But you actually... Uh, mentioned too in some of the work you've done that they don't always work. Nope. So, you know, share with us a little bit about that, especially when it comes to this, you know, moving through the patterns, the alternative plan, and uh, how we can use them for good. Because I'm sure they're good in some ways. They're just maybe not how we think of them. Right. And I, I, I call what I do with my clients power statements instead of affirmations. Because some of the new data is really showing that affirmations don't work if your brain doesn't believe you. And that's the secret is is your belief system is hardwired into your brain. And this is what's crazy is even if somebody produces evidence counterintuitive to what your belief system is, your brain will disregard it. Oh, they cheated or, oh, that was flawed. You know, oh, that was fake news. Whatever it is. I mean, the world is a great example right now. You <laughs> cannot outwire someone's belief bias. It is hardwired into their brain. You are the only person that can change your own belief system. So what I teach people to do is to create a power statement And it will help you make your brain believe it's a fact. So, you know, one of the things I wanted for myself is focus. So I have all my clients think of a word they really want to be that is like, what is the thing holding you back? Where most people, you know, your your affirmation may be, I'm focused and 
organized and your brain's like, girl, you're lying. (laughs) You're not going to out trick your brain. Like your brain knows what you truly believe, which is why sometimes prayer works. And sometimes it doesn't, you know, people pray about something and then they're in the back of their mind, they're on plan B, plan C, plan D. Your brain's like, you don't believe that. So it knows what you believe. If you're saying I'm fit, firm and healthy and in the best shape of my life, And your brain is like, you just gained 15 pounds. What are you talking about? So when you create a power statement, you have to go forward and backward. So you have to look at what's keeping you from it and then why you want it. And instead of saying I am, I say I will, because that tells my brain, oh, yeah, this is what we want. This is what we're doing. Because if I say I am focused, my brain's like, It doesn't believe me instantly. But if I say I will remain focused. And so I choose an action verb for my focus, which is remain, because that's where I tend to float off into never, never land. So then I chose very diligently the reason why I'm not focused. And for me personally, it's because all the other possibilities look so fun. And the one I'm supposed to be doing all of a sudden seems boring and mundane and I can't stand it anymore. And I'm an Enneagram seven, which is all the shiny, fun things. And so I just flip around all over to, oh my God, I can make anything fun. And so I understand this is what keeps me from it. And then I have to tell myself why I want it because success follows clarity. So every day I have my words right here. I literally have these two cards on my desk. I have screenshot them. They're on my phone. I never do anything without them. So when I catch myself losing focus, I snap right into it. I have a plan. It's my responsibility. And I say to myself, I will remain focused even when other possibilities seem more exciting because success follows clarity. And my brain's like, oh, yeah, that's why we're doing that. Success follows clarity. But I was truthful with my belief system. And then I went back to what I really, really want. Oh my goodness. Are you guys like obsessed with Stacy? <laughs> I am. Stacy, I know we don't have too much time here. I want to ask one quick question. How science can help all of us as investors improve our sales? Oh, it's so crucial because everybody that you're dealing with has a brain language. I call it the gratitude language. And if you understand how to tap into your client's gratitude language, you could probably sell them anything (laughs) because people all want to be seen, heard, and understood. That's our brain's innate wiring system. We all want that. Everybody wants that. From serial killer to baby, we all want to be seen, heard, and understood. And when you are speaking someone's gratitude language, they feel seen, heard, and understood. They'll pay more for something because they like you. They'll trust you. They'll do more business with you. They'll be loyal to you. The data is very, very, very clear on how brain activity influences a business relationship. And the three secrets to understanding somebody's gratitude language, it's a super simple formula I created in my research. It's called ESP. So it's the gratitude ESP. The E stands for emotional. You have to tap into someone else's emotional core. If they've got children, if they love their dog, if they say, I want a a view with a yard and and you're like, oh, that's part of what speaks their emotional language. Then the S is specific. So let's say you're showing them a house and you're like, oh my gosh, I found a yard for your dog. I know you love, you know, Fifi and I found a yard where she can't get out. It's going to be perfect. You can sit there and drink your coffee and little Fifi can run around. Be specific. That tells somebody you saw me, you heard Fifi's important to me. You feel how I feel. And then the P is for persistent. And this is the thing that most people miss in a business relationship. Of course, they love you while you're doing business with them. And then goodbye. And the people who are loyal, who refer you, who come back over and over 10 years later, they come back again. They send all their family members are the people who the business relationship is persistent. 10 months later, just send them a little email. I was just thinking about you. I saw another yard reminding me of little Fifi. Hope you're happy. 
That's all it takes. We think it's something big. It's not. It's very simple. And it takes 10 seconds to get a chemical activation in your brain. And it's the most underutilized form of communication in the business world. People are not using that part of the brain to create a business relationship. Yeah, it's so important. And it takes time, right, Stacey? But not tons of it. So you have to listen. You have to engage, right? And be responsible. Uh, Yeah. Oh, I love this. I love this. This has been great. Uh, We have to have you on or again and do something more with you. This has been awesome. And we probably have like 25 million other questions because I'm just and I obviously named our brain. So we love this topic, (laughs) (laughs) but we see it's so connected to the effectiveness of, of creating life on your own terms, creating financial freedom. It is going to get us there and, and and us as in, as, as in our community. That's why we're so um, focused on it because it's not just the, the how to, right. Which we have plenty of content about, but it's the the underlying, underlying pieces there. That's why we spend energy on these topics because they're going to be critical ladies to, to your growth and your success. So um, Stacey, where can the ladies listening, learn more about you and follow along your journey? Oh, thank you. It is. My website is thegratefulbrain.com. And it's grateful, G-R-A-T-E. People tell me all the time, I can't find it. And that word gets misspelled like crazy. Um, And you can find me on Instagram where I put free brain tips all the time at Stacey Danford. And my, uh, at my website, you can sign up for a weekly newsletter. I send out, I do research every day and Mm -hmm. I am constantly trying hard to stay on the cutting edge of neuroscience because it's changing as quickly as technology People don't realize that our brain is, we know less about the human brain than we do outer space. It's that magnificent and that quickly changeable. So (laughs) it's very important to look at research that's up to date because it's changing all the time. I am obsessed. (laughs) I'm obsessed with (laughs) it. Ladies, all this great information you guys can find on our show notes. Now we're going to transition to our fabulous three questions. The first one, Stacy, is what's the most transformational book you ever read? Uh, without a doubt, the newest one on my list is The Molecule of More. It is absolutely fascinating. It's by Dr. Lieberman. And it is the newest research on the difference between dopamine and the other three happy chemicals. We used to think all four of them worked in synchronicity, but now they are separate. And dopamine is what you want, but then why are you not happy when you get it? And the other three are making you happy now that you got it. Fabulous, fabulous book. Three, two, one, downloading it on Audible. You guys know me, so I'm going to be doing that today. (laughs) Second question is, what's the most powerful routine that you do to create a financially free and balanced life, whatever balance means to you? I would say start each morning with gratitude. That's when your brain is the most susceptible first thing in the morning. It lasts only for a few minutes and you have to do it before you get up. And so once your feet get on the floor and your eyes open, you've activated all these other areas of the brain. You want to stay in that sweet spot. It's called the fertile zone in your brain. But when your brain is between theta and alpha and right when you know you're awake, but you're still laying there, just start telling yourself all the things you're grateful for. I do it every morning for a couple of minutes. And it can be something as small as I'm grateful for eyes that see, for ears that hear, for legs that take me anywhere I want to go. I'm grateful for a little dog who's waiting for his food and a grumpy teenager in the other room (laughs) who reminds me that I'm here for a reason. Last question, which women, famous or not, has inspired you the most? It's going to sound a little crazy, but I'm going to say Annie Oakley. And most people don't even know who that (laughs) is. But I have a seven foot painting I did of Annie Oakley that's in my living room. I love her. She was, you know, a Wild West sharpshooter in a world full of men. And I checked out a biography of Annie Oakley in the fourth grade and fell in love with her. I'm a kid. Clearly, you can tell from my voice from the country. I'm from Texas. I love all things at nature and Wild West. And she was the first person that felt like me. And that's why it's so important. Representation is everything. Can you see yourself in a better life? Find someone who looks and feels like you and follow their journey. 
And if you can't find someone, keep digging because there's someone out there. But she was, you know, in a world full of men and excelled. And she was loud. She liked fringe. She liked turquoise. She was all the things I was. She wasn't quiet and ladylike and sweet. And I always felt like a failure because I was none of those things. I've always been loud and spitfire and rebellious. And I loved her. And I checked that book out every single week until my teacher told me I couldn't check it out anymore (laughs) because I had to let some of the other kids read that book. And every week I would go by and it was still sitting on the shelf and nobody else checked it out. And I would have little tears running. And I was like, Annie Oakley's on the shelf all by herself. (laughs) (laughs) She's still my hero to this day. My favorite quote is right behind me. That's Annie Oakley's that said, you may aim at the mark. You may miss it the first time. You may miss it the second time, but if you keep shooting, you'll finally get there. I love it. Stacy. thank you so much. That's all. I've got to look into her story. I love that. And I think that's why we are so passionate about the community that we're, we we built in our building because we want all women to see themselves and other women who are, are creating right financial freedom, but in a way that works for them and on their own terms. So love that you said that. Thank you so much for sharing all your amazing wisdom uh, with, with us in the community. So, so thank you for being on today. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to receive updates on our next interviews, go to our website, therealestateinvestor.com. There, you can subscribe to our show, become part of our investor community, and get updates on upcoming episodes. If you like our show, please share it with other women who would benefit. And don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, we encourage you to take one action as a result of today's show and put it into motion so you can live both a financially free and balanced life. Thanks for spending time with us. Ciao.